Now for the news analyzed. <clears throat> well, it can't get any worse. Well, let's see what they brought out. Hot from the wires. Question. How can you tell if cows are thinking or not? Answer by whether they're arguing or not. The life of a real thinker would be described as physically stripped, mentally enriched. Only the sensitive is stupid. Stupid worry about laughing at life. Under the most mundane of conditions, for example, some of you may know this, but it's given an example. Pertinent to the beginning of this news item, it says, The law permits he who has been first attacked to strike back and defend himself. Don't give up yet. <laughs> I'll go back and analyze it for you. I have extra analyzations left. Sports. Observable, scheduled news. I know several times we've mentioned sports, and it's not necessarily a good metaphor for life unless you're an ordinary person. And then you think, God, what a great metaphor for life. <laughs> you know, for instance, for a bunch of men to put on little short things and striped shirts and go out and hoop and holler and their girlfriends or family go in the stands and, yeah, right, that's a great metaphor for life. I guess according to how hard up you are from trying to get some kind of view about what could life be? And some of you are confused like most people. You think, well, wait a minute. Why don't I just pick out some kind of, a, what would, like a metaphor for life? Let me see. I'll pick out something that's even more confusing than life, in, you know, impertinent than life itself seems to be. So, I got it. Rugby. <laughs> lacrosse. Chess. Arm wrestling. <laughs> Simon Says. Is that a team sport? I guess according to how dumb you are. Stand up if you believe it's a team sport. Uh-oh. 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 <laughs> well, here's a piece of cultural news, which will be good. If you want to be a writer, but you've got no originality, no talent, or originality, here's what you can do. It's an old story, but you can always do, and this is in quotations, the kind of I shucked reminiscences regarding your childhood or your culture. You can, in fact, do your life that way. Well, we all, <clears throat> some of us already know that when in doubt, when in absolute desperation, with nothing to talk about, nothing to say, you understand nothing, will that stop a man? No. What do you do? You talk about yourself. So I ask you a question, well, aren't you an expert in such and such field? Well, it says so on the wall, doesn't it, that diploma? Well, good, but here's my question. You know, you're a doctor, a lawyer. Would anybody question an Indian chief? Not today they wouldn't. So you ask a man, and he's supposed to know, and he doesn't know the answer, what does he do? Is he going to go, <laughs> I confess. You know, this is a phony. I had that printed. No, no, no. A man will say, that, that is a very interesting question. Because back when I was in college, Under ordinary collective conditions, wherein most men live, of course, man is capable of two, count them, two degrees of chewing gum, stupidity. <laughs> two degrees of stupidity, two levels. He can either himself be stupid or he can become a critic of the stupid. Everybody who would like to be the latter stand. I didn't say Simon. Ordinary people, 6,000-year-old minds and 40-year-old bodies. Whether any particular human endeavor or activity seems operationally self-fulfilling or not is irrelevant, so long as men will discuss whether it is or not. I think I'll just read this because I can't imagine we'll ever get around to trying to analyze this. Let's just sort of slow things down for those of you that just had new pacemakers installed. 
I guess you can punch one another out there to make sure that the person next to you is either alive, awake, or not a Republican in church. Here's the item. And when to them the time seemed right, many of the men whipped out their little weapons <laughs> to confront what they had long perceived to be their opposition. And it, being the model for the word nemesis as distinguished from antagonist, bothered not to laugh or to not laugh at the impotency of their puny instruments. <laughs> Methinks, I read that. A dog named Chaucer bit me once. <laughs> Methinks that this has to do with, that this has to do with life and men's perception there, you know what, of. Under certain conditions, this, I want you to, it's, it's terms in here. I guess we will have to analyze this if it's ever going to make anything resembling sense. But here it is, under certain conditions, talk talk cannot substitute for body talk. But under no conditions can anything properly fill in for talk talk. When you have a cornucopia, what are you going to do? <laughs> Call cornucopia busters? Let's see. I guess we're going to have to, unless we're going to change absolute subjects completely, try and twist these so as to make them sound as like they had something to do with the kind of stuff we've been talking about. Everybody wants me to do that, Stan. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's hit sports again. It's been a while since. If you recall, we were talking about the other night and how continually popular the Roman games are under all kinds of guises. And in fact, if you can begin to see this, it is not sequentially this or that, and it's not one thing causing another, and I could even take a slightly altered position and try and take some of you who can see good and make you see it from a slightly different way than I was about to point out. But the more civilized you are, the less you are physically oriented, the less you are a throwback to prehistoric times inside of your own nervous system, the higher you live up in the nervous system yourself, collectively speaking, not individual necessarily true. There are exceptions, which once you understand the difference, there are no exceptions. But collectively, it is those people who most enjoy boxing, for instance. Commonly referred to as the world's crudest, uncivilized sport, which I don't know why they never include marriage or compare that. <laughs> but <laughs> as many critics say, a blight, a blight upon modern day civilization. That's the only sport. They're not out there playing football and that you, in the course of the game itself, may get injured. That this is the only activity wherein the purpose, the stated purpose, is to hurt your fellow man. Again, when they go start televising marriages, somebody go make a fort. <laughs> they say that. But I assume you know besides all these, which this is getting complicated, but some of you should be able to see it. Who gets, if they ever do advertise, or not advertise, they do an in-depth story on boxing. What do they drag out? The news people. Not that they're dumb, not that it's conspiracy. They drag out guys named Guido with their nose like this, or somebody all dressed up in a $5,000 silk suit who happens to live in Queens, happens to have a very Italian name, and seems to have no great source of identifiable income. <laughs> but it turns out he is very interested in boxing, and maybe he will admit that he has a slight personal interest in one or two boxers. Uh, but see, that's what they pick on. But who goes and pays money? Now, there's always some bricklayers and somebody out there, but who pays the big money for boxing? 
Who dresses up in tuxedos and evening gowns and comes up in limos, besides Guido, if you got a few bucks? It is the more civilized. It is the more civilized, collectively, that continues to have the interest in sports. And what I was trying to get some of you to consider before, not to prove anything, and you certainly know not an attack on physical activity or sports, but consider, as civilized as men claim to be, as much as they collectively would appear to be from certain views, how many people will turn out for a boxing match as, a composed, as opposed to how many people turn out for a poetry contest, a chess match? Not even a contest. All right, besides all sorts of other things, I want you to consider this one item. There is something even more subtle, because that's not too subtle once you see it. It's real subtle, but like always, to be able to see it and not feel critical about it. That's very subtle, baby, to see something like this and not look down that big old goddamn nose of yours like, well, a bunch of old crude people. And because all that means is, generally speaking, is that, uh, especially if you're a man, you're too big of a cream puff and you weren't very sports-oriented and you're ashamed to go in a shower and take off your clothes or take off your shirt. And so, therefore, ha, huh, look at those crude dunderheads out there playing that terrible game. What does that mean? So it's subtle if you can see anything and not feel critical about it. But, assuming that none of you, well, all right, if that applied to anybody, stand. All right. <laughs> we'll assume that it doesn't, and I was going to even make it more subtle, is what this news item is, is what is sports? It's a definition here is what it is. And it's three words, observable, scheduled, news. <laughs> If we were really good, by the way, you could almost say wars, <laughs> conflict, except you don't get those, the report, you don't get the score every day. I mean, you can get a score that, well, today, you know, the Serbs seem to have it over the Muslims again. But you know that's not the end of the game. Sports represent something. How about people that tune into sports just to hear the score? Now, again, assuming you don't have to be critical, but assuming that you could take like a from another planet view that here it is, some intelligent people, educated people, and you're driving along in their car or they're out at a fancy restaurant. They're at a social event and somebody go, wait a minute. And they'll ask if you got a radio and somebody, an important person will run back in a room and turn the radio for what? He just wants to hear the basketball scores. He knows that at 25 after the hour on some station, they always do the scores. He's not even listening to the game, which is another whole story to hear somebody describe on radio. <laughs> Physical activity. Well, <laughs> but my, my person is not even that. He just rushes in there and goes, wait just a minute. And all he hears is, you know, Lakers 27, 17, 149 to 117. They go, oh, 99 to 86, 110. To, and he goes, and he'll listen. And it's very important. He'll turn it off and he seems to feel better. All right, from one, if you could take an objective, some kind of non-critical view of that, like you're somebody from outer space, and you could go, what in the hell does that mean? How can that be of any kind of interest? <laughs> it is observable, scheduled news. Now, people will say that they have an interest in some team, which you can get silly and insightful about that. You could, if we were doing it to my fictitious guy, what I'm talking about, and let's say that we could get him to experience some anomalous moment of ephemeral lucidity. And he thought, geez, that is weird. You know, not rushing here and I want to hear the scores. But he would, you know, snap out of it. And he'd say, well, it's just that I have always had a great interest uh, in the Lakers. And if you really pushed him, like, well, why? And he, he'd surely come up with something. Well... Uh, I went to school with a guy playing center. Or I went. I, I used to live in California. A man would say something. But that's not it. Now he would have to say that or else uh, he would appear to be absolutely insane to say why he ran in there just to hear somebody read out a bunch of numbers. Of course, I assume that most of you don't know about the women that read out numbers on short wave. <laughs> Those of you who like conspiracies... <clears throat> well, nobody knows about that, eh? I don't have anything to do with it. F 
Forget my fictitious man's explanations that he likes, that he has a great personal interest in the Lakers, which is indefensible. I mean, that's not going anywhere. All you can do is say, oh, that's ridiculous. No, you don't. And he'll say something intelligent like, yes, I do. <laughs> and so that's ridiculous. And then he can really get serious and insightful and say, no, it's not. So you're not going anywhere. Now back to the news item. What does that represent? That he stands there and he rushes. Will go out of his way to hear the scores read. Numbers. It is observable schedule news. You know that you can turn it on if the world's still alive. That you can turn on that station at 25 after the hour and hear the scores read. That's news. And it's on schedule. You don't have to wait. They don't say, well, we're not sure whether Iraq will pull back completely from the northern area where the Kurds are curdled up <laughs> in, you know, in southeastern Turkey. Or you don't have to say, well, we were hoping that they would release the prisoners from so-and-so. This is schedule. Sports, they say the game's going to start at 8 o'clock. And you know it's going to be over within a certain range. And you know that you can turn on the radio and somebody will tell you numbers. They'll say 110 to 108. And then, well, I'll be down. That's not the point. What it was was schedule news. Think about the importance of that. The predictability. What else in life is that predictable? I'll give you a hint. Nothing. Nothing that they report. Nothing that passes. Reporting's not the point, but nothing that passes through the annals of apparent reporting, running through the ordinary human channels, apparently TV, but it's the human neural channels. There's nothing they can't announce. They're not going to say, well, tomorrow at 8.15, we will, the United States, we will, right at 8.15, be sure and be there, tune in if you've got pay-for-view, we will be attacking <laughs> Serbia, 8.15, <laughs> We're going to be in full dress uniform. We're going to be in our winter <laughs> uniform. <laughs> and, of course, there is other news. I can say, well, the president's going to address Congress tomorrow at approximately 1230. I know that kind of stuff. But the sports is consistent. It is one piece of news that consistently is on schedule. It is observable. It is not them talking about, well, somebody is working on a book. The president says that he's going to spend this weekend hold up behind a large tree trying to figure out what to do about the economy in his head. <laughs> you, know, you got his word for it. You got the news. But sports is observable. You can either turn it on and hear the scores or if you don't trust that, go pay your money and go out there. And sure enough, civilization's still rolling and the creek hadn't risen in an unduly manner. The game will go on. All you got to do is pay your money. And there is news that you can depend on. It is observable and it's scheduled. And do not underwrite that. And if, in case you do want to underwrite that and you think, well, I don't have any interest in religion, I mean in sports, then ask yourself about religion. <laughs> or ask yourself, why? The more, how about this? <clears throat> the more a man is of the conservative political persuasion the more he is inclined to be a masked wrestler. I didn't know I was going to say that. <laughs> the Church of England letting, letting women into the ministry clouded my mind and made me say that. I was, going, I, was going to, I was going to continue the simile having to do with sports itself, and it just... I, of course, apologize for anybody either from the church or from England or who might be a woman or anybody who even knows a woman. So. <laughs> Ordinary people. There was another news item in here. Did anybody? They must not have pulled it off the wire. But it said that there, that the, there was on this planet, it just, this one I was about to read reminded me, that it said there is on this planet a place where prehistoric creatures still exist, and a place where people from the future are right now living. And it's a place that no one has thought to look at. <laughs> Not the one that's actually here. 
It's a definition again. Ordinary people, 6,000-year-old minds and 40-year-old bodies. And there was another news item. Let me see if we can... That said that no man is younger than his ancestors, than his uh, genes, and that no man is smarter than his ancestors unless he can think for himself. That is a part of the one that I was going to refer back to, that if you want to be a writer, now take writer as really being symbolic. If you're just trying to do something in life, trying to show some originality, which is what the news item finally gets to in the last part, about that you could actually do it with life, but starting out with the apparent symbol, that if you want to be a writer, but you apparently got no talent, never had an original thought in your life, but you decide, I'd like to be a writer. I got this jacket this tweed jacket, this herringbone jacket with some leather patches on my elbows. I got it cheap, and I got a pipe. Now, I've always wanted to go to, girl, uh, to bed with a college girl that had thick glasses and pigtails and you know, knew who Chaucer was. Back to the news item. Everybody who thinks I got off the subject, would you stand? Oh. I almost stood. If you want to be a writer, but you have no talent, no originality, you can always do this. You engage in, quotation marks is one term, ah shucks reminiscences, unquote. <laughs> now that, that could sound, I guess to some of you, immediately like some sort of Faulknerian or some southern gothic manifestation, but they were having Mississippi southern gothic writings 450 B.C. in downtown Athens, Greece, that is, not Georgia. It's nothing new playing that, well, let me kind of spit, and then start playing, well, I shucks, and you start reminiscing, you start saying, well, let me tell you the kind of environment in which I grew up. And people will immediately fall for that. It's part of a game. There was another news item that didn't make it, if you recall, that said, uh, as long as people go along with it, you can pass off almost anything as an example of human intelligence. All you got to do is go along with it, and people have to go along with it. If you play ah shucks reminiscences about your childhood or your culture, I threw that in, or the news item did, because some people would try to weasel their way out. And if you have to reminisce, ah shucks, about your culture, all that proves is that you are of a higher degree of Philistinism than someone who does, ah shucks, reminiscence about themselves, about their childhood. Because if you have a weak sense of childhood, just in the ordinary sense, what do you do? You immediately look to your collective background, to your culture, your race, your religion, wherever you grew up. You grasp, well, you have to, to stay sane and stable. But people do that, and it passes off as originality. Not, as you know, this is not an attack, but if somebody took it as an attack, they could say, well, this is ridiculous because that is an accepted form, an admirably acceptable, renowned form of writing, of fiction. Well, and even nonfiction, but especially of fiction, is to reminisce about childhood, that you can, even in fiction, you can slip in great eternal cosmic truths under the guise of, ah, shucks. Well, it was just old me and my old uncle Hubert. And of course, the guy down the street that kept wanting to burn down our picture of Faulkner. Or how, however that worked. Check with that girl that majored in English lit. With a, the barn burners. Now back to ordinary people. 6,000-year-old minds and 40-year-old bodies, and also that no one is younger than their ancestors, their genes, and no one is smarter than their ancestors, unless they can think for themselves. All that put together spells something, and so here we go. Whenever you look at a person, look at yourself, but if you don't think about it the easy way, whenever you look at another person in their face, another human being, now, they'll try to distract you if they thought what was going on and say, wait a minute, don't just look at me like that. I'm Italian. Don't look at me just like that. I had diphtheria 
in a serious degree. I had, I had almost unbelievably bad acne when I was a child. In other words, they have to try and distinguish themselves, but they are calling upon the fact that they cannot be any younger than their genes. They have nothing original to think about, much less say, and so they must fall back into the arms of memory, even if it's not theirs personally. They will fall back upon the memory. Well, I know you look at me weird because of what I just said or what I just did, but I don't guess you know much about a Shiite Muslims. I bet you're more familiar with the Sunni. But let me tell you about us Shiites. You can, you can count on it right then if you know anything that you're fixing to hear. rock a bye baby. They're about to play Ah Shucks. It's just old me. Which it is. Except they take Ah Shucks as just old me as being some sort of form of self-congratulations. What they are doing, anytime a man tells you anything that came from the collective, we're about to tighten this up here. The collective is everyone's individual, if you want to, you can just jump this fast. Collectively speaking, inside of an individual, his genes, his ancestors, a 6,000 year old history, I just picked out that figure, is him. Which may seem to be, well, hey, we got a man of great depth here. <laughs> and in ordinary life, it does pass off. Well, one of the great, well remembered, and cherished proverbs in the world is which one? Screw you. No, that's not it. <laughs> Who said that? No, no, here it comes. Here it is. Man cannot know where he's going if he forgets where he's been. That, th that, that thing is almost bulletproof. It is so dumb and dense. <laughs> and so meaningful. So meaningful at the herd level. But that thing... God, you could put John Dillage in there if you could revive him, even, even with a renewed part of his private parts, and he would still be safe. You couldn't get to anybody in that. It, it seems, it is accepted as true, that a man who has some sense of the past, he doesn't have to just have majored in history, but a man who will tell you something about his particular past, and it even seems to be more intellectual, more civilized, if he will get away from just him personally, of him just saying, well, let me tell you where I grew up and where I went to school and all that. If you start saying, let me tell you something about not just me, dear friend, dear listener, but let me tell you something about my cultural background. Let me tell you something about my family, this small group of us who we all had to, or they did, migrate from Lapland back in the 1700s. <laughs> and the trials and the tribulations the lappers had trying to move into a new environment and especially we were of a religion that even anyway you do that and it appears to be by all ordinary drop the humor for a second <laughs> by all ordinary views people are accepted as being quite deep sensitive but what does that what is all of that saying from another view all of that is a stalling tactic. Every bit of that is an admission. They don't see it that way, but it is an admission of, yes, I do not know one goddamn thing personally. <laughs> but let me tell you what, I'm saying ancestors and genes, and picking examples like a specific religion or your particular line, but you do know, I know some of us don't like to think about it, we all had you know, Adam and Eve, so... I assume we all look at each other and think, well, I sure hope you're something like a 27th cousin. I know. <laughs> Instead of them telling you about yourself what seems to be where we were, what even seems to be more sophisticated, what seems to be more sensitive, what seems to be an example of even greater insight, is they do speak about the past of man. Normally people don't get that far, but even... The ordinary people, they would, they would probably agree if they could follow into this. And I said, well, I noticed that uh, your speeches, the books you write, uh, have a great deal to do with the Protestant movement in Lapland and how they had to immigrate because of certain problems going on in that area of Scandinavia and the North Sea. And they go, yes, yes. 
And it turns out the man, again, he does not have to be a historian, but he seems to be sensitive. He seems to be, what do they call it, in touch with his past, with the hardships of his particular cultural or racial or religious. It, by every definition, is accepted. And we're certainly not here to try and throw a monkey wrench in it, which if you tried, you'd have a monkey wrench driven up a part of you that you'd probably waste. Well, I wish I hadn't. Just to remind you that this is not an attack on people doing that. But you do realize when somebody does that, we're not wired up to see that. But when somebody starts telling you, uh, perhaps in great historical detail, it could be interesting. It could apparently have some sort of metaphorical message. But if somebody's going to talk to you, not just even about their childhood, but about their genetic childhood, which, as I said, ultimately is the history of man. What are they saying? They're saying, well, I don't know anything personally, but. Ah, <laughs> oh, shut. Let, let me tell you how man got to where he is. You mean using you as an example, somebody doesn't know anything? Ah, <laughs> oh, shucks, no. <laughs> so what you have, back to this, let's go back to the definition, try that one. Ordinary people, 6,000 year old minds and 40 year old bodies. You could, if you're following any of this, you could take that as being, assuming that any of you took it now, as being in some way a prejudicial definition, a less than complimentary definition, you could see it as being otherwise. Now, wait a minute. If that's an ordinary person, then ordinary people are where it's at. Because what you're saying is we, I just, they just picked that 40-year-old body, like be any age, but a grown person. That here we have an ordinary man or woman, an exemplary member of the human race, and to say that a definition of them is here they are at X age, their body is 40 years old, and they have a 6,000-year-old mind. That could, you could almost picture, if it was like the cartoon, if they still do it, a plastic man where things seem to, <laughs> that you see this body staying there before you, a 40-year-old person, but their mind is not so limited that their mind like stretches, if you could see it, is in touch with 6,000 years of history of man that they have this kind of storehouse upon which to call. Good. Now could we go back to mine. It is also an unwitting definition that yes, I do not know anything personally. Individually, nothing. I, 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 I don't know anything. But, I think we'll tend to change the subject right quick so that anybody who's beginning to examine the end of their own finger. <laughs> Whether some human endeavor, any, writing, talking about history. It says any. Whether any particular human endeavor or activity seems operationally self-fulfilling or not is irrelevant as long as men will discuss whether it is or not. I hate to keep picking on the same ones, but they're the easiest. Think of all of the human activities that by their own definition, self-fulfilling here, self-fulfilling, that they say, all right, the object of this, this particular activity, this academic activity, this cultural activity, whatever it is, it's, it's, their, it's their call. I didn't do it. Let them, they say, all right, here we are, and here's the purpose of what we're doing. And any of you who can see, you also know by now, even if you don't have to look at the example, if it's going to live, you know this, by their own definition, it's not going to succeed. Because if it succeeds, it's dead. So whether any particular human activity or endeavor seems operationally self-fulfilling or not is irrelevant as long as men will discuss whether it is. So it doesn't matter what humans do at the human level. It doesn't matter what activity they pick out. It doesn't matter what new idea they come up with and say, well, let's try this. It will be very meaningful if it works. Well, it's not going to work. And that's a crude way of putting it, but in case you miss, go back. Why do not people absolutely just 
they would have started out scoffing, laughing, and then probably just got mad enough that they could have put enough pressure on television stations and newspapers to do away with weather forecasting. <laughs> or astrology. I was going to try to be nice about it. Or religion. For just people just to look point blank at it and think, well, this damn thing doesn't work. Why the hell do you keep, I, I buy a newspaper and you spend half a page telling me the weather. I can close my eyes, I can put a dartboard at home and say rain, cloudy, overcast, and throw a dart, and literally, I got the same chance as this. But no. Or religion. Any human activity, anything that is singular to human, whether it is operationally fulfilling, self-fulfilling or not, is irrelevant. Irrelevant. As long as men will discuss whether it is or not. Now, if they don't discuss it, it's dead meat. That is the end of it. Because as long as they're arguing, as long as somebody will get up and argue the point, say that I did pick on religion. I'm not sure who'd get up and defend weather forecasting. But what if I did attack or economics forecasting? Political forecasting? If I attacked that or somebody attacked it that they appeared to be serious, somebody would get up and defend it. And so, and it can't be defended. That's not the point. But as long as they do defend it, then it's irrelevant whether the thing is operationally self-fulfilling. That is, whether it works or not, I missed the whole point. It gives a whole new definition, may I suggest, to subtle. If you thought, and of course, I guess some of you now have your idea that I use subtle as a synonym for confusing. All right, anybody that thinks that, sit down. <laughs> There's so many things. Anything in life, marriage counseling, psychoanalysis, just the ordinary kind of promises that people make to one another, the marriage vows. There are people out now wringing their hands. There's nothing new about the number, the percentage of marriages end up in divorces. And doesn't the swearing mean anything that you say, I'll love you forever? What's happened to humanity? Nothing works. Not in that sense. The human nervous system at the neural end being a forever incomplete sentence. A forever work in progress. Pardon me, all you artistic folks. Then its output, its product, its work product is of its very nature always incomplete. Nothing works. You cannot build prisons and rehabilitate people. You cannot build churches and make people better. You cannot put up satellites even more in the sky and predict the weather. That's enough example. But do you understand that's not the point? As long as men will discuss it, and all the ones I just named, somebody, many people, sane, educated people, would take the opposing view. Me attacking, uh, if it sounded like that to them, attacking weather forecasting. You do know that right now, NASA, the U.S. government, directly and then indirectly through them, they're already plotting. Before you die, it's going to cost you personally, I don't know, two or three more thousand dollars for them to send up telescopes that rhyme with trouble <laughs> to send up additional additional meteorological equipment and it will not do any good. Well, they'll never get down to predicting the weather. Of course, they're getting a few other ones off the subject. Uh, it's not just them, but every now and then life puts in like, for those of you that think that life doesn't have a sense of humor, is now what weather forecasters are referring to or how for a while the butterfly effect, which is simply pointing out that everything's connected and there's so many unpredictables, so much unscheduled news as possible, <laughs> that even, even after they give it their best attempt, being the educated, reasonable men and women that they are in the business, which they are as well as good as anybody else, that a butterfly can come over where they they have already predicted and they were correct. They took all the whatever they do that this low pressure system was here and it was going to push this high pressure on eastward because of the Gulf Stream, and 
theoretically, if not practically, they wouldn't want to say practically, a butterfly. One butterfly can unexpected expect it to fly in there and that fast change the weather. And they say that and kind of smile and will even explain that much. And if you were, again, intelligent at all, you go, you know, that's got to be true. I'm, I didn't major in meteorology, but yeah, I hear what you're saying. But they simply mention it and that's the end of it. But it is a trap door open seven days a week, 24 hours a day, anytime they want to. And it's always kind of now hanging in the background, which religion is sort of the mother of all of that. Which they don't put it that directly. It's like, yes, all of this may be just a bunch of crap, but you'll never know till you die. <laughs> That's obviously not the way they put it. They, they, they put it another way, like, I'm sure you find some of this hard to believe, all you good parishioners and followers, but you just wait until you die and then you'll see I was right, which is... Sounds better, I know. <laughs> I guess that's why some of us never got through theological <laughs> seminaries. As long as people will defend, as long as people will discuss whether something is working or not, even though it is patently not working, they can't seem to make it work, as long as they will discuss whether it's working or not, it doesn't matter. Because if it matters to you, then you're part of the discussion. You're just in there churning it up. Like you're churning as all you know. What appears to be great activity. And of course, since you're paying a commission, you assume it's going to be great, potentially positive activity, financially beneficial to you to have an, a broker who has churned your account. Every day he calls and tells you, aha, I've got something brand new. This time we're going to hit it big. And it's just known as churning your account. Just He doesn't care what. He just picks out, instead of picking out the weather, he throws it and, you know, into the stock report. And he says, we got a, this brand new stock. You'll love it. It works. You can say, well, it don't work. Sure it works. Are they still in business? Well, yeah, but I don't like it. Well, that's one of the reasons they're still in business, is people like you don't like it. It doesn't matter whether it works. If people will discuss whether it is operational, whether it is valid, whether it has any potential, if men will discuss it at all, I guess we could get crude. If men will talk about it at all, it's working. It can be insanity from certain views. You can start picking on flying saucers. How in the hell can a reasonable person believe in flying saucers? I might. I might, and then you go into absolutely just inconvertible undeniable, reasonable, rational proof about, wait a minute, I know that there are reports all the time, I know that the library is full of books, but tell me this, how come one of those saucers never lands in the quadrangle at Cambridge, or it never comes down at MIT, or it never comes down at the White House? It always comes down in Mississippi with a bunch of drunk fishermen in a pickup truck. It comes down to some woman who carries around crystals and goes, ooh, you know who lives in Mongolia? You know, don't give me that. <laughs> the person I just did that's all upset, he is partially responsible for flying saucers. <laughs> Fool that I am, I guess I was hoping for more of that, that some of you, more from that. From, from a view, from a rational view, something can be insane. Non-existent. Impossible. But if people are discussing whether it is impossible, whether it is sane, whether it is rational, then you have missed the whole point. It's just churning up the accounts intellectually of man. Yeah, but I don't like that because men, they just won't think right. Men spend a whole lot of their time on useless stuff. Well, tell us about it, sir. <laughs> well, I will. And what's he going to name? Now, he calls it useless, and he could even have rational arguments, but understand this. Anything he points out that he says is useless, insane, just absolutely, if not a waste of time, in fact, detrimental to the progress of man, what will it be? Is there any chance, how about this, is there any chance it would be, how about this, the Latin language? Dodos. Is anybody catching it? Dinosaurs. No. No, no, no. No. It will be something quite active. 
alive, breathing, bouncing right up and down the streets of his neighborhood. And part of what keeps it breathing and bouncing is him and his fellow, those of his intellectual ilk going, that's terrible. It's insane. We can do it real crude. How about, you know who in large part helps keep religion going? Atheist. You knew that. Under certain conditions, talk talk, and this is hyphenated, talk talk cannot substitute for body talk, but under no conditions can anything properly fill in for talk talk. Under certain conditions, you can dress up rutting like Cupid and it's still rutting. You can... Dismiss verbally being of good health. You can, under certain conditions, or under certain conditions, it would be detrimental. It says that talk talk will not substitute for body talk. There are times in everyone's life going on continually that using the symbol again of hormones versus neurons, that hormones talking need to be talking and to try and replace them by neurons talking is not proper. But under no conditions, that kind of looked that enough. Under some condition, under no conditions, let me do it the way it was originally read, under, under certain conditions, hormones talking cannot be substituted with neurons talking. But under no conditions can anything substitute for neurons. If it is your body trying to talk to you, there is no way to properly substitute that with this talking to you. And please note that people continually do it. All forms of, uh, well, almost all forms, sometimes it's of no consequence, of religious rituals, of dietary laws in some religions, of... Uh, all sorts, anything that directly affecting the body. I was going to say circumcision, but I know many people get the willies. <laughs> or at least half of us here do. <laughs> there are aspects of everyone's life wherein hormones are properly talking and do try and substitute to try and even interfere with what they're saying through neurons talking which is what all religious ritual is, which is what all morality is. It gets a little more vague, but please note that nothing is forbidden that is not natural. No matter where you are or who you are, there is no collective, there is no cultural prohibitions against anything that's not natural. Let's just say eating glass. There's no religion I know of anywhere that has ever said, you shall not eat glass on Fridays. <laughs> If it is not natural, it is not forbidden. <laughs> all rituals, all morality, once you can see it, to make it fast, is to varying degrees an attempt to substitute body talk for talk talk. <laughs> and with ordinary people, you know, it doesn't do much of anything. It's neither good nor bad, it's just another hobby and they can argue about it that somebody who does believe in some kind of dietary religious law could jump up if they heard this and go, well, that's not true. Wait a minute. And then somebody else could say, ah, oh, that's ridiculous. And we could have you know, religious people and atheists fighting or short people and tall people. Except they've got to take it personally. Just being tall won't make you fight. And somebody has to say, God, you're awfully tall. You say, who the hell do you think you're talking to? My family was tall. You've got to listen fast, don't you? <laughs> Only if you want to. There, under certain conditions, there is no way to substitute body talk for talk talk if you're trying to do something on your own. But under no conditions, as the rest of it, under no conditions will anything substitute for talk talk. 
I can still whittle. <laughs> Under certain conditions, the mind cannot substitute speaking for the body. But under no conditions can anything substitute for speaking for the mind. Which the collective tries to do. Well, of course, thanks to the urgings of life, I'm not holding them responsible. Poor cows, none of their business. Life made them do it. But you are, the first part, surely all of you already know that. It just was put in a different way. That you've got, there is no profitable way. It just says under certain conditions. But there is no profitable way if it should be the body talking. Don't be trying to let the mind talk. And people, you could say individual, would have never come up with it. And that's why it seems to be always an institutional directive. That there seems to be some sort of outside pressure, some sort of outside direction that you would have not individually have conceived of that tells you do so and so and it tells you here and for whatever reason you can figure out by now you think well I will do that I will quit drinking milk I will quit eating two days a week I will sit out in the cold at times when I feel depressed I will take off my clothes and go sit in the snow but it's not because you thought of it it's because you know, somebody told you to, an institution, a leader, a head cow, a book. But you would not have come up with it. You've got no business under those conditions, I was trying to pick out fast, dangerous ones, of letting the mind do any kind of talking wherein it should be the body talking. But under certain conditions, talk talk cannot replace, should not be substituting body talk. But under no conditions can anything Replace talk talk, which, I know we're running out of time, but which, the final part, is a real devious way that life turns back on itself that makes a Klein bottle look like an upright citizen. <laughs> that many people would go with the first part of the news item once I explained it as clearly and concisely as I know I have. That under certain conditions, talk talk cannot substitute for body talk. Many people go, yeah, I got you that. You know, it can lead to psychosomatic illnesses and all sorts of things. You can become a hypochondractor. <laughs> but the last part is what really gets. But under no conditions can anything properly fill in for talk talk. And you can even get people to say, well, that's true. If it is something that should be an intellectual exercise or if it is something that you should be dealing with the mind. And I could even make a hard example for him or an easy one and say, all right, you're getting close. And they'd go, that's all right. If you had to work out, what if for a living, or you were taking a test, an exam, or you had to, for a living, you're a surveyor, and you had to work out certain matters and problems and trigonometry, and it came time to do it, whether you're going to get paid or whether you're going to pass your surveyor's exam or whatever it is, and you should be thinking about it. And instead of writing down the answer when they give the problem, you write down, I've got a stomach ache. <laughs> and they would say, all right, that's true. But it's not true. Because that's how people live their life, is all shucks. They would say, yes, there, there are areas wherein a man has got to be using their mind. There are certain things. A chess game. You can't sit there at a chess game, for instance, and do body talk to your opponent. <laughs> You can't tell your opponent, all right, I know you're about to check me, but I'll whip your ass, you ugly, you ugly son of a bitch. All right, you, know, you might scare him for a second, but all he's got to do is call over somebody, take care of you. They can say, all right, you cannot let, see, that's an example. That would, a place where it should be talk talk, it should be neurons. And you can't let hormones come in there. And it sounds like that they have got it down, don't they? Well, other than this, other than if you open up your eyes and look around at what they call it, oh, life. Yeah. It is going on continually, but it passes as thinking. To say that under no conditions, as this says, can anything properly fill in for talk talk with ordinary people, that's not quite true. Because ordinary people, anything can. What do you mean anything? 
read my anything. If it has words on it, it'll work. Now, as long as it's not outright gibberish. I mean, it may not make sense. They may not agree with it, but that doesn't matter because if they don't agree with it, they're going to go, wait a minute. Wait a minute. No. Nah. No, I hear what you're saying, but that's not true. See, and that would be the kind of people that don't remember or wasn't here to hear the earlier item. What do you mean it's not true? It doesn't matter whether it's true. If you'll argue about it, it's all right. It's working. No, 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 no. Remember, one more time, the last part, under no conditions can anything properly fill in for talk talk, which what he's saying is under no conditions to a would-be independent thinker can anything replace true independent thinking. Nothing. N-O-T. Nothing. Nothing. And you could get people to say, all right, you know, it's your kind of special terminology. I know what you're saying. And that's true. I agree with that. So what's the big deal? Well, the big deal is that's not the way life works. They will take anything. Anything? We've been through this. I said anything. Yeah, but you didn't mean anything. Well, tell me what you think. And whatever they tell you they think, if you can see, you look at them and you think, who's talking? It's a 6,000-year-old mind. Maybe a 40-year-old mouth. In a 40-year-old body with a brain going, well, I'll tell you what I think. He's not telling you what he thinks. He's giving you a history of the dense bovine movement of the collective intelligence. And he says, yes, that's what I think. Thank you for your views. Everyone may sit down. If anyone's named Simon, please forgive me. <laughs>